if you think a little bit about how we work, and I've written here observational epidemiology, but the truth is this applies to randomized trials just as much as it does to observational epidemiology. And uh, the example that I'm going to show you is an, a, a randomized trial. But if you think about how we work in, in epidemiology, if we're doing our job well, the first thing that we do is we start with a study question. Of course, we know that many times we start with have data, can do analysis, but that often gets us into trouble because we start off with data and then we don't actually know what the question is that we're trying to ask. But if we've done things really well, we started off with a good study question, and then we choose a study design that is designed in some way to minimize sources of systematic error. All epidemiology is an exercise in the rational use of limited resources, so we're never going to have the perfect study design, and sometimes we make decisions that say that we have to have a, a study design that might allow more bias to creep in, um, because that's all we can really you know, afford to, to make happen. So these are trade-offs, but we're trying to, in some ways, minimize the amount of bias. Then we conduct our study. And then when we're done, we calculate some measure of association, risk difference, relative risk, hazard ratio, whatever it is. And then we quantify the random error, right? So we have some sort of a p-value, a confidence interval, maybe you're doing fancy Bayesian methods, but you've got some quantification of the random error. You would almost never publish a study where you had no confidence interval, no p-value whatsoever. There are exceptions, of course. Really large studies can often get away with it. But in general, you, you just wouldn't get away with that if you tried to submit a study for publication with no quantification of the random error. Then we adjust for measured confounding. So say you're doing the study of, of alcohol consumption and lung cancer. You collect data on smoking because you know that's going to be an important confounder. You would never say, well, you know, we collected data on smoking, but we don't really feel like adjusting for it. We're just going to publish and we'll, we'll, we'll leave it alone, right? You would never get away with that. You have to adjust for the things that we think are important confounders. But then when it comes to residual systematic error, so the uncontrolled confounding, misclassification or measurement error, information bias, and the selection bias, we just sort of think about it, right? We put it into the discussion section of our paper. And in fact, we put it in a very specific place in the discussion section, right? We put it in the limitation section, which is almost always the second to last paragraph because you don't want to end on a downer, right? <laughs> so you put it in that second to last paragraph. And then you often are doing that in an attempt to minimize the impact, right? I'm trying to convince you that, yeah, I made these, these errors. I have these problems, but really don't worry about it. No big deal, right? Which is why I, I have often said that I believe that the most common phrase used in all of the epidemiologic literature is some form of the phrase, we had non-differential misclassification, therefore the bias was towards the null, therefore you don't have to worry about it because any effect we observe would in fact be greater, right? Which is a really problematic statement for reasons I will sort of touch on a little bit. But the fact that we are doing that, right, is, is our way of saying to you, really don't worry about it, right? This is what we refer to as the confessing your sins approach, right? As long as I tell you I did it and the reviewers can accept that it is good enough, we just sort of move on. And that's where the whole non-differential misclassification biases towards the null causes us problems because we know that there are lots of situations where it doesn't actually bias towards the null. But then what do we do? We interpret the results based on almost exclusively that random error estimate alone, right? Is it statistically significant? We might get into, is the effect meaningful? But we ignore all of the things that I've just told you were problems with my study in the limitation section when I draw my conclusions. In fact, often you find that the conclusions are actually drawn in the opening paragraph of the discussion before I've even told you what the limitations are. So we have a system that is kind of designed to fail us because all of those assessments of random error assume a perfect world. They assume no bias in data collection or analysis. So we're living this fiction where we pretend all of the things that went wrong can be ignored and we can draw conclusions based on only that assessment of random error. What we never do or we rarely do is quantify the impact of the systematic error, despite the fact that methods to do so are very simple. Again, that's why I do them, because they're simple. And they have existed since the 1950s or 1960s, right? They have been around forever in the world of epidemiology, and yet we don't really use them. 
So just to give you an example of this phenomenon, you pull any journal article from any major journal and you scroll down to the end, find the limitation section. I picked one recently from the COVID-19 vaccination uh, program in Qatar, looking at the effect of children and adolescents. You scroll down to the end and they say, home-based rapid antigen testing is not documented and thus was not factored into our analysis. However, it's unlikely that home-based testing would have had different differential effects on the following cohorts. In other words, we measured the tests that happened in the in the, the PCR tests, but we didn't measure home tests. And but you know what? Really, don't worry about it because there's no reason to think that the effect of testing would be different in the vaccinated and unvaccinated. So non-differential misclassification bias towards the null. We observed an effect, so any effect is actually larger. Leaving aside the fact that I would think there actually are reasons to believe there would be differential effects, but even leaving that aside, I don't think it's enough to simply say we had some non-differential misclassification, don't worry about it. And I, I, I said to you, I believe that non-differential misclassification biases towards the null is the most common phrase used in the literature. I, I actually, in 2019, went and pulled all the um, editions of, of the major epidemiology journals and the major medical journals, all of the non-trial, non-methods papers, and went to their discussion sections and looked at what people were actually reporting, 84% of them, some form of non-differential misclassification biases towards null, occasionally differential, but usually non-differential. Some discussion of uncontrolled confounding, right? The second most common phrase is all observational studies are subject to some unmeasured confounding. And then sometimes people talked about generalizability, which I actually think we could argue about whether or not that's a limitation of a study or not. It is, but it's a little weird to, to put in a limitation section. And almost no one discusses selection bias. If you know anything about me, you know I hate selection bias, so I can relate to that. But the point being, it is we rely on this, these, these stock phrases to convince you, really, don't, don't worry about it. Despite the fact that, as this paper that my colleague Jennifer Island put together, there are so many exceptions to the phrase non-differential misclassification biases towards the null. It is true that it is the expectation in a lot of cases, but there are so many exceptions that just choosing to rely on this, this, this phrase in our discussion section, I think does us a real disservice as a field. And the example, and many of you know this example because I use it all the time, because I think it really illustrates the problem, is relying on the idea that non-differential misclassification biases towards the null only works if you exist in a world of the job of an epidemiologist is to determine whether or not exposures have effects or don't have effects. I was always taught the job of an epidemiologist is to determine, the, to obtain a valid and precise estimate of the effect of an exposure on an outcome. So we need to know not just what is there an effect, but what is the magnitude of that effect? Because if you don't know the magnitude of the effect, you can't make good public health decisions. And this example, I think, illustrates that. This is the, uh, a meta-analysis that was done on the relationship between HPV and cervical cancer. And you can see these are, I don't know if people can see the mouse, but these are done in, in chronological order. Um, as over time, the tests for detection of HPV got better and better and better. And here's what the results show. So if you look back in the, the late 80s, when the tests for HPV were not that great, we were looking at odds ratios in the neighborhood of three to five. When you get into the 2000s, when the tests were much better, we had PCR tests, we're talking about odds ratios of 700, right? That's non-differential misclassification biasing towards the null. But if you don't know how much, you can't make good public health decisions. An odds ratio of three to four is a problem. Absolutely, we would wanna do something about that. But an odds ratio of 700 is a public health emergency and we drop everything and immediately do something. So without quantification of the impact of the bias, we are missing all of the really important information. And so to give you a, an example of how we go about trying to deal with this, I'm gonna talk about the, the NoShot study. And the NoShot study was one of a series of trials that I had the privilege of working on with colleagues all over the, the world. Um, in which we were trying to um, uh, find ways to improve access to and outcomes for, for, for uh, antibiotic treatment for kids with severe pneumonia. Because 
any of you who work in, in uh, childhood illness know that pneumonia continues to be one of the biggest killers of kids worldwide. It's on the decline, like infant mortality is in general, but it continues to be one of the biggest killers. And it isn't because we don't have safe and effective treatment. Antibiotics work, penicillin works for severe pneumonia. It's that it's hard to access treatment in a lot of places. So um, the policy at the time we were doing these studies that the WHO had was, if you had a child with severe pneumonia, you had to go to a health facility and be hospitalized and treated with injectable penicillin. When we have oral antibiotics, amoxicillin, which are equivalent pretty much, that work really well, but the feeling was you couldn't actually treat with oral amoxicillin at this time. So we were trying to do a series of studies to ask the question, is it safe and effective to treat kids in the community? And I had two important roles on this study. Uh, number one, I was the data analyst. So I am responsible for anything that went wrong on the data analysis side. And I am the one who came up with the acronym No Shots, which I was very proud of. I don't even remember what it stands for, but it was a study about not giving kids shots. And I was very proud of that at the time. So the question we were trying to ask in this study, and again, this was a series, one of a series of studies, was in kids with uh, WHO defined severe pneumonia, and I'll get to what that means in a, in a bit, uh, three to 59 months of age, is treatment failure six days after you begin treatment equivalent when you give home-based oral therapy compared to hospital-based injectable therapy? It was an equivalency trial. And if you know anything about equivalency trials, if you're going to do one, right, and you wanted to just say two things were equivalent from a statistical standpoint, say if they're not statistically different, then we'll call them equivalent. Well, you just have a tiny study and nothing would come up as significant. So you can't do that. So you actually have to have a bigger sample size in an equivalency trial. So this was a study in, in kids with lower chest wall indrawing, cough, and difficulty breathing. And I'm going to explain what lower chest wall indrawing is in a minute. But that lower chest wall in drug is how the WHO defines what severe pneumonia is, or at least it's how they did at the time we were doing these studies. It was an unblinded equivalency trial, unblinded, uh, because it's really difficult to blind kids as to whether or not they went home from the hospital. They tend to notice. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't blind them on that respect, but we did our best to blind the assessors as to what the failure were. And it was a, a randomized trial. It was, we randomized over 2,000 kids in Pakistan, one-to-one to, -one to home-based therapy or injectable therapy. So in other words, kids come in, they're diagnosed, and they either get randomized to stay in the hospital and get injectable uh, antibiotics or get sent home with oral antibiotics. And then we see six days later how they're doing. The outcome was treatment failure at six days. And we defined outcome to be persistence of this lower chest wall indrawing that I'm gonna talk about in a second development of any danger signs. So that would be death, obviously, is the most severe, but then things like inability to feed, abnormally sleepy, cyanosis, things like that. There were some other uh, criteria that we used, but the majority of the treatment failures were for these reasons, so I won't go into the rest of them. And for an equivalency trial, you have to define a priori what you're going to consider to be equivalent. So we define it as a risk difference with a 95% confidence interval within plus or minus 5%. So if you think about that, plus or minus 5% on the confidence interval means your point estimate is going to have to be pretty close to zero in order to call these equivalent. And here's what we found, and I apologize in the room, you can't exactly see all of this, but we found a, a failure rates of 7.5% in the home arm, 8.6% in the hospital arm. So uh, a risk difference of minus 1.1%. Uh, with a 95% confidence level from minus 2.5 to positive 1.3%, so within that equivalency margin. And in fact, if you were to believe that negative sign, it would indicate a, a ever so slight benefit towards the home arm, but nobody really believes that home is better. Really, it's just you know some random noise around the, the null, and voila, we have equivalence. Great news. So the first thing you do as the data analyst when you're, when you're putting together the study is you put together your table one, your baseline table, your comparison between treatment groups. And I put together this table one and suddenly noticed some things looked kind of funny, which is we had a difference of 16% uh, vomiting in the hospital arm, but only 10% in the home arm. 
15%, uh, sorry, 10% with diarrhea on the home arm and 5% in the home arm. 21% with antibiotic use in the previous seven days, 16% in the home arm. That's kind of weird. And I saw this and honestly, my first reaction was devastation. Because if you look at these differences, they're actually not that large, right? If you saw this in an observational study, you wouldn't think that's too concerning, right? But I am of the belief that a well-conducted randomized trial with small flaws is treated much more harshly than a very large observational study with lots of flaws. And so my first thought was, we're, we're, we're done here, right? We'll get it published, but no one's going to ever hear about this study because we've got this really big flaw. And I'm just going to foreshadow right now, we do not know what happened. We, we have some hypotheses that I can talk about later at the end if you want, um, but we don't really know the answer as to what happened. But again, I just want to point out, these are not huge differences. It's just unusual, right? You wouldn't expect this to happen. So I showed this to my colleagues, many of whom are clinicians, and they said, okay, well, it's a problem. It's not great. On the other hand, most of these things really have nothing to do with pulmonary disease. So really, you know, let's just move forward. So we write this up and we submitted it to the Lancet. And then we got the reviews. Reviewer number one said, there seems to be a selection bias and possibility of failure of randomization to this open label trial. I would dispute that it's selection bias. I think it's confounding, but who cares? That's just semantic. I know what they mean. And then reviewer number two, and if you've ever published thing, you know it's always reviewer number two that gets you. <laughs> reviewer number two says the imbalances in baseline characteristics table one show some alarming discrepancies. I did not find them alarming, but okay, <laughs> alarming. 16% versus 10% vomiting, 10% versus 5% diarrhea. These look odd for a trial with a thousand plus in each arm. I totally agree. The authors somewhat opportunistically comment that these imbalances were in covariates unrelated to the severity of pulmonary disease. With respect, and you know when you hear with respect, <laughs> what's coming next is not gonna be respectful. This misses the point. We need to have reassurance that these differences were not indicative of some failure of the randomization process, a failure which itself may be the symptom of a wider malaise. Someone's been studying for the GREs. <laughs> Specifically bias in outcome assessment, which might not mean anything to you, but I totally understand this and let me explain why they're concerned about this. So I told you in the beginning, the disease we're dealing with here is severe pneumonia. It's diagnosed and our failure definition is based on resolution of the symptom, uh, lower chest wall indrawing. And for those of you who don't know, lower chest wall indrawing is a sign of very labored breathing in kids, right? So their rib cages have not yet ossified. And so if you have really labored breathing, what happens is paradoxically, when you're breathing in and the chest should be going out, the lower part of the chest actually goes in. And that's just a sign of, of severe, Ill, you know, severe disease of distress, respiratory distress. But it's really hard to diagnose. So let me show you this video that we used in our training, right? Here's a child. Is the, is the lower part of the rib cage going in or is this normal breathing? it's hard to say, right? There are, there are some cases where it's very obvious and there are other cases where it's really hard to define, right? Here would be a case where it's probably, probably going on, but we can't say for sure. The next one you'll see, it's, um, it, it's pretty clear. Um, so sometimes it's, it's easily diagnosable, but oftentimes it isn't. And what the reviewer is saying here is, the randomization is the easy part. It's a coin flip. You just got to assign them to arms, right? If you couldn't do the easy part right, why should I trust you did the hard part right, which is the outcome assessment? That's the really hard part. And so, and, and I say that partly because, you know, the, the, the failure of randomization, right, those differences, anything that I measure, I can adjust for. Okay, it's true. I can't measure for anything I didn't adjust for, but those differences were not super large that you would think there's probably some unmeasured confounder that's really different. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but I'm just saying it's, it's not the bigger concern. The bigger concern is the outcome misclassification. And so the solution was, okay, we need to actually look at what the impact is of this mis misclassification. Because honestly, when I read these reviews, I thought, you know what, the reviewers are right, right? We actually, we have a problem. 
So that's what we did. And, and to do this, we used quantitative bias analysis, something that you know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about. And so I'm going to go through just a little bit of, of the things you need to know for bias analysis. I apologize because I know everybody in this room and everybody online knows these things, but I'm just going to say it again just to make sure we're all on the same page. So with bias analysis, the first thing we need to do is some assessment of the amount of problem, the amount of bias, in this case, a misclassification problem. So for that, we need classification values. And so if you think of truth being in the denominator, so if D disease or outcome in this case is the truth and T is my test for treatment failure, then the first thing I need to know is sensitivity, right? That's the probability of being correctly classified as having the outcome. So it's the probability that the test for treatment failure comes up positive when you are truly a treatment failure. And specificity is the opposite. It's the probability of being correctly classified as not having the outcome. So it's the probability of testing negative when you truly do not have the outcome. And we can also think of sensitivity and specificity when it comes to a misclassification problem as being non-differential or differential. If I have non-differential misclassification, then that means the rates of outcome misclassification do not depend on the true value of the exposure, right? The kids who got home-based therapy would have the same outcome misclassification rate as the kids who got hospital-based therapy. Whereas if it's differential, then we believe they are different across treatment arms. The next thing I need to do quantify the impact of the bias is I need a model that relates those bias parameters to the observed data to get the data that I would have observed had there been no bias. And the model for a misclassification problem is fairly straightforward. So imagine that we lived in a world where we knew the truth. So I've got my exposure across the top here, my outcome on the side, and I've classified the uh, cells of the two by two table for the truth with capital letters. Well, the observed data, if I have misclassification, is just gonna look like this. And it's, it's really simple. So just take the A cell, the exposed cases, a times the sensitivity are going to be correctly classified as having the outcome. And A times one minus the sensitivity are going to be misclassified as not having the outcome. And then I can do the same thing for the C cell, right? The exposed non-cases. C times the specificity will be correctly classified as not having the outcome. And one minus the specificity times C will be incorrectly classified as having the outcome. And then I can do the same thing for the unexposed group if my sensitivity and specificity are different across arms. And I come up with this formula here, very simple. We don't live in a world where we know the truth. We are living in the world where we know that we have the observed data and we want to get back to the truth. So I can algebraically rearrange that data and you end up with this formula right here, which is not very complicated, right? The exposed cases that I would expect to observe had there been no bias is just the A cell the observed exposed cases, minus one minus specificity times the total N divided by sensitivity minus one minus specificity. Whatever's left from the end, N that's not in the A cell ends up in the B cell. And now I have a formula where if I have estimates of what the sensitivity and specificity are, I can get a sense for what I would expect the truth to have been. Really easy, again, not complicated. Again, these are formulas that were, were worked out in the 1960s. Now, we have uh, a textbook that we've written that um, gives you all the methods that you need to be able to do this. Um, the first edition was written in 2009. The second updated edition was written in 2021. Um, the interesting thing about the book was even though we wrote it in 2009, apparently it's been for sale on Amazon since before we were a country, <laughs> but it cost $809 apparently. So I'm going to be making a lot of money if you buy a copy. <laughs> Neither of these are true. And I'm not here to sell a book because what I am here to do is say, you don't need the book. All you need to do is go to our website where we have all of the tools that you need freely available to do the bias analyses. You don't have to memorize any of these formulas. And this, we have SAS code, we have R code, but we also have just very simple Excel spreadsheets that allow you to do this. And they're set up so that all you have to do is fill in in the blue cells your observed data, put in values for the sensitivity and specificity that you think are the correct values, and you will get updated bias-adjusted estimates down here. 
Very simple and straightforward. You don't have to remember any of those formulas. And so that's what we did. We took our data and we said, all right, let's, we don't know what the sensitivity and specificity of treatment failure are, but let's make some assumptions and let's see how it impacts our results. So the first thing we noted was we had very low treatment failure rates in this study, under 10%. So it's unlikely that specificity was a problem. In other words, it's unlikely that we were falsely concluding kids were treatment failures when they weren't. The bigger problem is we were probably considering kids, uh, missing kids who were treatment failures. And it's differential misclassification that people are concerned about, not non-differential, right? People are concerned that we were more likely to miss failures in the home arm than in the hospital arm, right? Nobody is concerned that we made the hospital arm look better than it was. They're concerned we made the home arm look better than it was. And in fact, sending kids home is dangerous and we just missed it because we didn't uh, 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 assess the failure rates well, right? So there, and therefore, if you look here, I've got sensitivity of failure in the home arm across the top, sensitivity of failure in the hospital arm across the side, we assumed, we set the specificity to be perfect in both arms. I'll show you later, you can relax that assumption and it actually makes the results even more uh, in favor of what I'm gonna show you. Um, and if we lived in a world where we'd actually done perfect outcome assessment, so the sensitivity in both arms was 100%, then you would get our observed result, minus a risk difference of minus 1%. Anything along the diagonal, would represent non-differential misclassification because the values would be the same. People are gonna be concerned about the values above the diagonal. Those would be the places where we did a better job at assessing the treatment failure in the hospital than we did in the home arm. And that's why we made it look like the home arm was just as good as the hospital arm when in fact it was worse. And here are all of our bias analyses. What we get from this is that outcome misclassification would have to be highly differential. In other words, it would have to be perfect in the hospital arm, something that cannot happen because of that symptom that's really hard to diagnose. So even if you wanted to, you're never going to get perfect sensitivity. And 70% in the hospital arm, uh, sorry, in the home arm, before you get to the point at which the estimates flip to a point at which you're really observing more harm in the, in the home arm than the hospital arm. And even then, if you were to calculate a 95% confidence interval on this, it would still be within our pre-specified 95% confidence limits for equivalence, which is to say, yes, we clearly had a problem, but our results just are not sensitive to the assumptions that we make about the misclassification to get to a point at which you would assume there is actually harm. It didn't have to go this way, right? Sometimes small amounts of misclassification lead to large amounts of bias. This just happened to be a case where large amounts of bias lead to almost no, uh, sorry, large amounts of, of uh, misclassification lead to almost no bias. And the problem here is if we had not done this analysis, we would be very open to the criticism that, you know, maybe in fact the home arm was worse. But when you actually quantify it, you can see that it really doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, you don't have to agree with me, right? You could think my assumptions here are terrible. So we resubmitted this to the Lancet and the reviewer agreed with us. They were convinced that it was not a particularly important problem and we got it published. But we published it along with all of these analyses. We did more than just the one that I'm showing you, these bias analyses, along with a link to our spreadsheets where you can go. And if you don't agree with my assumptions, you can make your own assumptions. And we invite people who disagree, do your own analysis and write a letter to the editor. To date, we've not had anybody disagree with our conclusions based on the results of this analysis. The point here is quantification is always gonna be better than just discussing it in the limitation section, which honestly is what we had done in the first draft of this. Quantification of systematic error is always better and it's not hard to do.
Now, I will say one of the things that we didn't do is we ignored, in this case, the uncertainty in the bias parameters. We just looked at a bunch of different assumptions and quantified the impact. But the reality is we don't know what the best values are for the bias parameters. And in fact, our results, I just gave you a smattering of results. Which one is the best result, right? We don't get anything from that table I showed you. So a better approach, and this we, we do talk about in the book and we've got you know, example code for you, is to make uh, assumptions about the bias parameters by putting distributions around them rather than assuming they are fixed and known. And we use an example that I'm going to use. Um, I'm going to use beta distributions. If you, if you don't know beta distributions, they're a really flexible distribution that can take on values anywhere between zero and one. These are some examples of what they can look like, but they turn out to be very easy to parameterize if you have actual validation data, which is why we like them. But if I can put a distribution that expresses my uncertainty in what those values are, then I can do Monte Carlo simulations, do the bias analyses for every sampled set of values and get a distribution of adjusted results that I can summarize much like I would a 95% confidence interval. So to show you, um, effectively what we do is we follow this, this um, algorithm. So we start off with the two by two table. We put in probability distributions for the bias parameters, in this case, the sensitivity and specificity. We typically use beta or trapezoidal distributions. I'm gonna use betas here. And then we bias adjust the data probabilistically. I don't have time to go through the whole algorithm, but it is there if you wanna go through it and it's available on our website. And then after we bias adjust the data once, we summarize the results with a risk difference, relative risk, odds ratio, whatever you wanna use, and we save it. And then we do it again, and we do it over and over and over, each time randomly sampling a new set of bias parameters from those distributions so that we really realize the entirety of all of those distributions and get a frequency distribution of all of the possible results. Then when we have a frequency distribution, we can summarize that using the median as equivalent to a point estimate. And we can find the 2.5th and 97.5th percentiles of that distribution to be like a 95% confidence interval. We call it a 95% simulation interval, but it's, a, it's not because it's not a confidence interval. Um, and you are probably, if you're gonna do this, you're gonna do this in SAS code, you're gonna do this in R code, but we made spreadsheets where you can actually run these simulations in Excel if you want a quick sort of introduction to this. It's very hard to run a lot of simulations in Excel. So I've only run a few here, but the idea here is they look, you know, similar to the simple spreadsheets, you input the data here, but now the difference is I'm gonna input beta distributions in this version of the spreadsheet rather than a single value. I don't have time to explain beta distributions um, uh, in detail, but suffice it to say, um, you can calculate the mean of a beta distribution uh, by taking alpha divided by alpha plus beta. So in other words, what I've done here is I've chosen sensitivity values in this example, although I'll show you, it's not what I actually chose in the end, both of which are centered on 0.9 or have a mean value of 0.9. And the specificity values both have a mean of 0.99. And in this example, it says non-differential misclassification, but I'm gonna show you, I actually used differential misclassification. Then you tell it how many simulations you wanna run and you hit run and it spits out results down here. So let me show you what this looks like. Here's what I actually used. So I assumed that the sensitivity was centered on 0.7 for the home arm and 0.9 for the, uh, the hospital arm. Because remember, we're concerned that there was lower sensitivity in the home arm. I put specificity at 0.99 rather than at one, but you're gonna see the, those distributions are very shifted to the right, skewed to the left, I guess you would say. And I looked at differential misclassification because again, we're not concerned about non-differential misclassification. When we run the simulations, these are what the distribution, those beta distributions end up looking like. You can see the, the sensitivity in, the, uh, in the, the home arm, sorry, the hospital arm is shifted very much to the right. The sensitivity in the, uh, the hospital arm is shifted to the, sorry, in the home arm is shifted to the left. No, sorry, hospital arm. Um, it's truncated here at 0.5, but you should know it just, it does keep going and it trails off. And you can see both the specificity distributions are very, very shifted. They're all gonna be very close to one. 
And then we get a set of results. So I've got my conventional results on the top, right? That's my point estimate and 95% confidence interval, which goes from 1% to, oh, sorry, minus 1% to minus, call it minus 4% to plus 1%. But then if I look at the bottom here, this total error interval is an interval that combines both the systematic and the random error. And now I get an interval that is shifted to positive 1%. So ever so slight benefit to the hospital. But now look at my interval. Now it goes from minus 3% to positive 10%, which is to say the point estimate really doesn't change very much. But what does change is if these are reasonable assumptions for the distribution on the bias parameters, we should actually be far less confident in our results. And we really should have done this before we published it, because I, I think it is fair to say that while the best estimates here is still the null, or 1%, whatever you want to call it, we're not as confident in that being truly null as we were had we done a better job of classifying people. Whenever you have to account for a source of systematic error, you should always be less certain in your results. And I think this is probably a more honest depiction of the total uncertainty that we have in these results, right? We're, we, were, we were being overconfident in the main paper that we published. And I think that's a, that's a lesson. And therefore I wanna use this to actually think about overconfidence, right? Because I think that bias analysis has a role to play in a phenomenon of overconfidence, something that we have seen tremendous amounts of during the COVID pandemic. And I just want to say up front, uh, most of my thinking on this um, comes from a paper that Tim Lash wrote in Epidemiology on Heuristic Thinking and Inference from Observational Epidemiology, and then a, a paper that Sandra Greenland wrote on the need for cognitive science and methodology, and both deal with the issue of heuristics. So I'm not sure how many of you have spent much time thinking about heuristics, but uh, Daniel Kahneman run, won the Nobel Prize for his work in heuristics. He's written this book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which is written for a, a, a popular audience. So many of you probably have come across this. But heuristics are just tools that we use, strategies that we use to simplify tasks that would be too difficult to solve rationally. So we use heuristics all the time. They are fantastic. They are how we survive as a species, right? You had to, every time you wanted to cross a street, do a calculation as to whether the car that's coming at you is gonna be in the space that you're gonna be in when you cross the street, the car would be there and gone by the time you did the calculation and you never get out across the street, right? So we need these tricks to be able to make quick judgments. And most of the time they work really well. The problem is heuristics come with these known biases built into them. They are fairly universal. They, are, they exist across cultures. And because of them, they lead to problems in trying to draw inferences that we have fallen prey to, I think, a lot during the COVID pandemic. They're often referred to as cognitive biases. And if you can go to the Wikipedia page on cognitive biases, there are tons of them. But let me give you an example of one. So imagine you decide you want to buy a car. You want to buy a... a, a, a SUV, and your criteria is you want to buy the one that is the most reliable. You don't want a lemon, okay? So what do you do? In, you go to Consumer Reports. You look at all the data on what's the most reliable car. Back in the old days, you could have called up the Car Talk guys and asked them what's the most reliable car to buy. So you do all your research, and everything tells you the Honda CRV is the most reliable car to buy. So you call up your friend and you say. I'm gonna buy a Honda CRV. Can you drive me over to the dealership? I need a ride. And your friend says to you, do not buy a Honda CRV. I had one and it broke down all the time. Do not buy that car. Do you buy the car? Most people do not buy the car. I can tell you, I would not buy the car. This is what we refer to as the tyranny of the anecdote. It's also sometimes referred to as the availability heuristic. The idea that one cogent, salient anecdote from someone that we know and trust overrides all of the data. And we are subject to this as humans. And it turns out not only are we subject to it, but it often gets worse 
the more training we have in the field to which is relevant. Okay. And there are tons of these heuristics that I think have played a huge role in why I think we've done a lot of um, damage during the COVID pandemic in our ability to interpret the research that was coming out. Part of this, I think, is attributable to a quote from Michael Ostrom who said, when you've seen one pandemic, you have seen one pandemic, which is to say, we were in a situation that was totally unique. We had no information at the beginning of the pandemic. We had to rely on the vast amounts of information that started to pour in because we didn't have much additional information, right? We understand the general structure of how epidemics work, but COVID was totally different than anything we had seen before. And that turned on the fire hose of research that started to come out. We had to sift through what was the good research and what was the bad research. We're not used to this process, right? Our process in research is we generally go through a process where we accumulate evidence over time on the effects of an exposure and an outcome. And that time period can be quite long. And only when all the evidence points in the right direction do we make public health decisions around that intervention or exposure or whatever it is. We don't deal with these very short timelines. We didn't have the luxury that we normally have, so we were in a completely unique situation. And a situation like this is ripe for all of these cognitive biases to steer us in the wrong direction. Plus, we had to deal with the armchair epidemiologists, right? We had people coming out of nowhere who believed they understood epidemiology better than we did because they knew how to do a Google search or, you know, had a cousin who knew somebody at the CDC or whatever it was, right? So we're dealing with a lot of really complex forces that were forcing us to make these really fast decisions in interpreting a vast amounts of evidence. And I think the biggest problem we, we suffered from was the overconfidence uh, cognitive bias. So the other overconfidence cognitive bias is exactly what you would expect to be. So this has been tested all over the world. I'll show you data from students, but it's been done in populations everywhere, different groups. So the idea here is you go out and you ask, in this case, 100 students to give you their best guess at some parameter that they don't know, but they can sort of give you a guess at. So something like, what is the average annual temperature in New York City, right? You don't know, but you could sort of hazard a guess, right? But then I say to you, okay, don't just give me your estimate, your best guess. Put a 50% confidence interval around that, which is to say you would be willing to bet 50% odds or you know, one-to-one -one odds that the value, the true value is going to be in your interval. If we were good at this, right? If we were really good at this, and I ask you 10 questions, 50% of the time, the value should be in the interval, and 50% of the time, it should be outside the interval. The reality is um, much different. So this is the distribution you would expect for 10 questions. You would expect five right to be the most common, right meaning the true value is in the interval. But, you know, so it wouldn't be surprising for some people to get two and some people to get nine, right? But the most common thing is you're going to get five. What you actually observe is a distribution shifted to the left, which is to say people are making their intervals too narrow. They are overconfident in their ability to guess at unknown parameters. And as I say to you, this has been demonstrated all over the world, different populations. It's also been shown the more training that you have in a particular field, the worse you do because you get more confident in your ability to estimate the parameter, which is to say, we as epidemiologists think we're really good at diagnosing the literature. We are probably overconfident in our ability to do that. And someone who had less experience might be better at, tell, at, at accurately telling you what they don't know. And I think this is where we got into a lot of problems, right? It's the, it's equivalent to the the, the weather, you know, uh, uh, forecasters, right? Weather forecasters 
are actually very good at their job, right? We all think they are, they're terrible at it because we remember all the times when they told us it was gonna rain and it didn't, right? But actually, if you go back and look, they never told you it was gonna rain. They put a percentage on it. They told you there was an 85% chance it was gonna rain. And you interpreted that to mean it is going to rain. But actually, if you look at the data over time, 85% of the time that they say it's gonna rain, 85 with an 85% chance, roughly 85% of the time, that's what happens. You remember the 15% when it doesn't happen and you think they were wrong, okay? But in our case, we actually probably are overconfident in our ability to accurately assess, to draw inferences from data. And this is where I think, again, where I think bias analysis comes in, right? This is a paper that Rich McElroy at the University of Minnesota wrote. If we are going to get, get uh, accurate estimates of the uncertainty in our, in our analyses such that we can draw valid inferences, we have to be willing to make assumptions about what the bias parameters are. We have to be transparent about what the biases are. And we have to be willing to put accurate assessments on what our uncertainty in those values are. Otherwise, we will always end up being overconfident in our findings. Bias analysis helps us get us out of the trap of overconfidence because it forces us to actually be explicit in quantifying the uncertainty. And it's worth noting, this is not a quote from the paper, it's just worth noting that any analysis that you do where you know you have a source of systematic error and you don't do a bias analysis is effectively doing a bias analysis in which you assume all of the parameters are perfect. And we know that's not true. We know that's not true. We are kidding ourselves when, as I said in the beginning, we draw inferences based on those random error assessments only. And my favorite example of this from the pandemic was the COVID prediction models, right? The COVID prediction models were terrible, right? And part of the reason we think they were terrible is because we think only about the actual line of prediction. We don't think about whether or not the values that were being predicted were within the uncertainty intervals that those models actually produced, which would give us a different assessment if they were using really good methods to estimate the uncertainty. So this is uh, from the Intercept it's back in the, you know, sort of the early days of the pandemic when they noted 2.2 million people in the US could die if coronavirus goes unchecked. This comes from the Imperial College model. Everyone remembers the Imperial College model. Um, I had the pleasure of sitting with the Imperial College group during my sabbatical in 2019, just before the COVID pandemic. And I can tell you, they do really good work. 2.2 million, actually, we ended up right now, we're at one point something million, right? And infectious diseases, errors are on the log scale, right? Not the additive scale. So really not off by that much. Now, of course they were off in that that 2.2 million was an, ass an assessment of what would happen if we did nothing. And that 2.2 million would have been in a very short period of time under their models. So, okay, that probably wasn't very realistic. It's also not realistic because there's no world in which we do nothing, right? Doing nothing means literally doing nothing. In the absence of governments doing anything, individuals will always take precautions. That wasn't the point of the model. The point of the model was simply to say, this is what will happen, or what our best estimate is, if we do nothing. The problem that I have with this model was, in the main report that this is based on, there is not a single uncertainty interval. The appendix has uncertainty intervals. But what is the media going to pick up on, right? They're going to pick up on the main report, and they're going to look for a number. We have to convey the uncertainty. Without conveying the uncertainty, the 2.2 number looks ridiculous, right? Okay, that's the IHME model. Uh, sorry, that was the, the Imperial model. The IHME model was the model that was actually used the most often here in the United States. And this model got it wrong often, right? So this is, uh, this is taken from the early days of the pandemic, right? Here is their prediction model, right? So the solid red is the data, the actual um, data up to that, that point. The dotted line is what they predicted was going to happen. And the shaded red is their uncertainty. What is wrong with that uncertainty? Does anyone have a sense for what is wrong with that uncertainty? It gets better the further we go into the future. That cannot happen, right? Uncertainty is worse 
in the future than it is about our predictions about what's going to happen tomorrow, right? This is not a model that is giving us an accurate depiction of the uncertainty. It's no wonder people lost faith in this model. But to be fair, there was a paper that showed that this model actually wasn't very good at predicting what was going to happen the next day. So often <laughs> the next day estimates were outside their uncertainty intervals. Okay, it got better over time, but I'm just saying in the early days, there clearly was something wrong. But my point here is we are very overconfident when we don't give accurate assessments of the uncertainty in our results. In addition to that, as we all know from our, you know, trying to digest all that information that was coming out, there was just a ton of bad information that was coming out, right? Nothing had time to be peer reviewed. And even if it did, we know the peer review process doesn't filter out all the, the bad information. And it just turned out there was a lot of bad information. We think we are epidemiologists, we have training. We can sort out the good information from the bad. But the reality is we actually have too much information to be able to actually digest it all and then put accurate estimates of the uncertainty when we know there is bias, right? I can't mentally adjust for the bias in all of these studies to tell you what I think the end result should have been. And just to give you one example, so here's a, this was a study that was published in Nature Communications in which they actually use bias analysis to try to estimate what different states' results for the amount of COVID and COVID mortality would have been had we been accurately assessing COVID because there was underdiagnosis. We know that people were not always getting tested. And so they generated these maps which were adjusted for their assumptions about the underdiagnosis of COVID. And then you get a map that is much more like reality but I think the bigger message is what you get is a map with a lot more uncertainty in what the actual values are. Because again, anytime you have to account for a source of systematic error, you get wider intervals. The wider intervals are just a, an expression of the reality. We didn't know as much as we thought we knew. And if we tried to make decisions, based on intervals only from the data, we had very narrow competence intervals around them because we had tons of data. But we were fooling ourselves, right? The reality is very different. And when you account for the systematic error, you get a very different picture. And I think being more honest about the uncertainty helps us not be overconfident in knowing what we know. And I'll just end, uh, last example, talking about this recent meta-analysis that I'm sure you all heard about on the effectiveness of masks. I know you all have feelings about this paper. I have feelings about this paper. This is the paper that sparked Brett Stevens to write the uh, opinion piece, Mask Make Mandates Did Nothing. Will any lessons be learned? I have real problems with this meta-analysis in part because you can go and you can look at all the data. And there were very few studies in this meta-analysis there were actually studies during COVID. Most of these were studies of respiratory illnesses prior to the pandemic, but they were also of very mixed quality. If you actually look at the good quality studies, they show a protective effect. But regardless, whatever you think, which are the good studies and which are the bad studies, if we actually went about quantifying the impact of the known biases that is in these studies, we would likely see a benefit of masking policies, but what we would really see is we don't know whether or not masking policies work because there is so much uncertainty, so much noise. It just tells us we need better studies. It, it seems to me a huge travesty of the COVID pandemic that we didn't actually do better studies of the effects of masking and masking policies to be able to answer this question. But one thing I can tell you is we don't have the answer to this question and no meta-analysis that exists now is going to do that because we just don't know how much bias is left over. We don't have enough data to be able to say. So do I think that quantitative bias analysis would have solved all these problems or would it have just led to inaction, right? That's the biggest criticism we get for bias analysis is whenever you do bias analysis, you always get wider uncertainty intervals. If you have wider uncertainty intervals, that just means we don't know. And therefore, that will just be used for people to say, maybe we don't have to do anything. 
COVID, we didn't have the luxury of not doing anything. We didn't have the luxury of waiting. We were gonna take action no matter what, but at least if we had accurate assessments of the uncertainty in our evidence, I think we could have been better at changing course when things didn't work. If you say, we know with certainty that X works, we are going to ignore all of the evidence that proves it doesn't work, and we're only gonna look at the studies that show that it does. There's really good evidence from this, from the pandemic, the confirmation bias was rampant. And I think that again, if we don't make strong statements, we simply let the data speak for itself, and we accurately express the uncertainty, I think we do much better, and we allow ourselves the ability to change our minds, which ultimately is what we are supposed to be doing as scientists. And I'll just end with the fact that um, the last thing that I think was, was terrible during the pandemic was our communication of the science. So this was a, a tweet from Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, that says the good thing about science is that it's true whether you believe in it or not. Do you think about it as kind of a weird statement, right? <laughs> it is true if you're Neil deGrasse Tyson that there is scientific facts about the physics of the universe that are pretty undisputable. But that's not the world we live in, right? We live in the world where we're talking about people's behaviors, right? People's biologic processes. There are tons of studies on different topics that come to different conclusions. And we don't always know what the underlying single truth is. There often isn't one. We have to be better at communicating that, right? Telling people the science is the science or trust the science, I think is problematic. And one of the groups that actually was the best, I think, at communicating this was it turned out to be Stakeums. If you know Stakeums, they were fantastic during the, the pandemic at calling out the problems uh, around science. So this tweet that they did was the irony of Neil's tweet is that by framing science itself as true, he's influencing people to be more skeptical of it in a time of unprecedented misinformation. Science is an ever refining process to find truth, not a dogma, no matter his intent, the message isn't helpful. And they did all of these weird, but wonderful <laughs> tweets, threads during the pandemic about uncertainty, about misinformation. And then at the bottom, they were always explicit in reminding you that they were there to sell a product. And so you should really not take advice from a company selling faux meat products. I don't really even know what Stakeums is, but I know <laughs> that at the end of the pandemic, I was very happy to buy Stakeums. So my point here is I think we need to be better at communicating our results, which is better at expressing uncertainty. And we have to be better at living with that uncertainty and not convincing ourselves we know things that we don't know. So I'll stop there, but thank you for listening. I, I appreciate it and happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, I'm getting some uh, questions in the chat. Um, maybe we'll just start in the room uh, and then I'll take a look at these. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Fox? So, this is a comment, not really a question. Um, I'm interested in the questions around, a lot of questions around antibiotic resistance. And there are certainly places in the world where it's very easy to get antibiotics. And also there are vaccines for pneumonia. So I don't know what the vaccine schedule is in the world, but I'm interested in sort of the focus on treatment as opposed to prevention in your study. Why we were focused on treatment? Yeah. Um, so, so both strategies are, are important. Um, rollout of, of pneumococcal vaccine and hip vaccine are happening around the world, but the, the, the uh, uptake rates are, and, and not just uptake, but distribution and, and uptake is, is just not nearly as high as we want it to be. Um, and so we, I don't think we can vaccinate our way out of the problem, but there's no doubt that, that vaccines are, are a big part of why the number of, of kids dying from pneumonia is is way better than it was, even though it still continues to be one of the biggest killers of, of kids worldwide. So I, I think we need both. Yeah. Question from Sharon Green at the health department. Um, could Dr. Fox please situate the E value within quantitative bias analysis framework you covered? Which I guess is the uh, uncontrolled compounding issue. Yeah, so uh, just to, to make it clear. So the E value for anyone who doesn't know, is a, uh, a method developed by uh, uh, Ding and, and Vanderweel, 
Um, it is a form of quantitative bias analysis. It is a form of quantitative bias analysis uh, for unmeasured confounding, though they've, they've recently developed one for uh, misclassification, I believe as well. But the, the main one we're talking about, the E value is for, um, for unmeasured confounding. And uh, it's, a, it's a method that uh, is a, it's a really simplified version of quantitative bias analysis. And the way that it does the simplifications is it makes two really important assumptions. The first is, um, oh, so, and I, I only talked about one form of quantitative bias analysis for misclassification, but for an unmeasured or uncontrolled confounding problem, the bias parameters that you need are the prevalence of the confounder in the exposed, prevalence of the confounder in the unexposed, and then the strength of the effect of the confounder on the outcome. Those first two parameters can be, you could divide them, and then you could summarize that as the strength of the effect of the confounder on the exposure. You still need the baseline prevalence, but so, so you've got the strength of the effect of the confounder on the exposure, strength of the effect of the confounder on the outcome. What the E value does is it says, okay, let's just set those two values equal to each other. That way I reduce the number of parameters I need, just one, one parameter for two. Then it says, okay, I need to know about the distribution of the, the confounder in the exposed and unexposed. I'm just going to set those to basically be 99% in the exposed and 1% in the unexposed. More extreme, but effectively like everybody in one group gets the confounder, nobody in the other group gets the confounder, okay? If you do that, everything now simplifies to one number, right? And you don't have to make any assumptions. So what the E-value does is it says, based on your observed data, I could just plug it into a formula and it will tell me what strength of effect does the confounder need to have on both the exposure and the outcome to get my result, my observed result back to the null. I'm not a huge fan of the E value for a couple of reasons. Number one, the assumptions that I just listed are kind of absurd, right? When are we ever gonna have a confounder that everybody in one group has and nobody in the other group has, or it's not, you know, not perfect, but, but that's, that's a really, really uh, unevenly distributed confounder. Um, the second is why would we ever assume that the exposure has the same effect on, uh, so the confounder has the same effect on the exposure and the outcome, okay? Second problem. I can, I can probably live with those two, right? But, um, but then you, we run into a problem that, um, if I, if I now use the E value, I'm, I'm trying to say, what is, a plot, what is a set of results that would get me back to the null? If I haven't made it clear already, I'm really not a big fan of null hypothesis significance testing for many reasons, but one of which is, I think it gives us this obsession with the null, right? The job of an epidemiologist is not to determine whether or not an exposure has an effect. The job is to determine what is that effect. And if we focus only on what gets us back to the null, we miss the focus on what are actually plausible estimates for this bias and what size effect is left, or association, I should say, is left over after we account for it. So this focus on the null really, really bothers me. Third thing is the answer, unless you have a large effect size, the answer to the E-value question is almost always going to be yes, there is a plausible set of confounders that could explain your results. Could doesn't mean it did. And therefore, I, I just don't know what we get from the E-value. So not a huge fan. Thanks. Um, question from Anthony Conrardi. Um, does Dr. Fox believe that researchers don't just don't think about QBA as part of their research or is more likely that it is consciously ignored out of fear of not having a more definitive answer? I think it's both. I think people, you know, they're, so we've been, we've been harping on this for years, um, but uh, currently we are not incentivized to do bias analysis, right? As a culture, we accept the confessing your sins approach as a, as a viable approach. And therefore anything that I do with uh, a bias analysis is always going to make me less certain in my results. And therefore What's the incentive to do it, right? Why am I ever going to do a, a implement a method that is going to widen my intervals and make editors and reviewers less confident in my results? The answer to that, of course, is honesty, right? Because you don't want to convince yourself that something is true that isn't true. But our job as academic epidemiologists is to get grants and to publish, right? 
Okay, no, it's not, right? Our real job is to identify the truths of the universe. But what are we actually evaluated on? Those two things. And you want to get grants and publish, you're not incentivized to widen your intervals. But if we really believe that our job is to get at the underlying truths of the universe, we, we do want to do this. So that's one reason. I think the second reason is we don't teach this enough, right? So not enough uh, folks have familiarity with the methods and feel comfortable with it. Third is editors and reviewers don't demand it, right? So, so think about this. So if you are a, um, the reviewer of a study and you identify a problem, you are now in the position of having to say, I believe this is a flaw that is big enough that it invalidates the conclusions or it isn't. I, I don't have the tools to be able to do that in my head. I have no way to determine whether or not I think a bias has a big impact. And what quantitative bias analysis has taught me over the years is I am terrible at being able to predict what the impact is. And I do this with my students in a course that I teach on bias analysis. Every time we do one, I say, make your predictions as to what's gonna happen given a known set of bias parameters. And we're always wrong, right? Large amounts of bias often have no impact. Small amounts of bias often have huge impact and you cannot guess, right? So our ability to, to, to just simply guess is pretty poor. So now as a reviewer, if I know that, I, I can either you know, go with my gut or I can just kick it back to the editor and say, here's some problems, you decide whether or not it's important. If instead I took the time to do a bias analysis, because I can do it with all the information they've provided me, right? So I could do it and see whether or not it matters, but who has the time? I don't have the time. But I could go back to the editor and say, I don't know whether or not this is a big problem. I'd like to see the authors do a bias analysis. Then I'm putting the work back on them, but they now have the opportunity to convince me that this thing that I think is a problem isn't a problem, or tell me that actually it is a problem, but now we've got a better estimate of the uncertainty. It's more realistic. Now are you willing to publish it? I'm, I'm gonna be much more supportive even if their, you know, their estimates go back to the null, because we want to know about null findings too. That's the way I think. Does everybody think that way? Probably not. So currently, I just think we don't have the incentives. Um, so that relates to one of my questions, and maybe you've answered answered it in part or in whole. But we, as you reminded us, we've known about these techniques and approaches for quite a long time, even in the field of epidemiology. And what, why has it sort of been? Why is it faded and receded into the into the past and not used more systematically by um, by those of us practicing epidemiology in our curricula? I think you've answered some of it, but that's a long time where we've had these tools around. And um, and second part is for the journals, like we have we have noticed where there are best practices in the conduct of epidemiologic research and published guidelines and uh, best practices for, for them, um, you know, consort statements and all myriad things. And um, your, your descriptive epi uh, paper that came out recently is another example of, of the kinds of things that I think, you know, we need more of mm -hmm. in the field. What about a checklist for quantitative bias analyses that, you know, journals could adopt? Do they have, like, is it, would it be easy for them to tomorrow say, we want, we would like to expect this of certain kinds of articles to us? It would, it would not be hard to do. My experience with checklists are, uh, they are, except for randomized trials, they are pretty much ignored, right? So even journals that say we use the, the strobe statement don't seem to uh, ask authors to actually follow the strobe statement. And I do worry that we are a bit overloaded with, uh, with checklists that, that, you know, and that's part of why you know, people don't maybe use them as much as they do. But it's interesting because we do, we, we insist on them, right? The consort statement absolutely has to be followed when you do a trial. So we, we definitely could use them. I, I just think there are so many options when you get into the observational world that it just kind of breaks down. I, as far as the first part, I mean, I'll say something a little bit that contradicts what I said before. I mean, there is, there's always a part of me that, that does wonder if maybe we actually do know what the impact of a, of a bias analysis is gonna be, and that is why we shy away from it. Um, there, was, there, was a, there was a study in PNAS maybe, or one of the nature journals, I can't remember, that um, 
that came out during the whole replication crisis in psychology, where they they did a whole bunch of replications of um, the, it was in a nature journal because they did a whole bunch of replications of studies that had findings that had been published in nature journals. And so they, they start up this initiative, they're gonna do all these replications. And then what they did was they asked, uh, they did a survey of, of people as to which ones they thought were gonna replicate and which ones they thought wouldn't replicate. And then they set up betting markets where you can actually bet on and you know in theory make money off of your prediction as to whether or not a finding was going to replicate. And the betting markets were really good at predicting what was and what wasn't going to replicate, which is to say, I mean, you know, psychological sciences are different from epidemiology, which is to say, I think we actually maybe have a good idea of what good science is and what bad science is. If I have said this a million times, so many of you have probably heard me say this before, but uh, I've always wondered if, if when you published a paper, you had to risk a thousand dollars of your own money couldn't be grant money, it had to be your own money, that your finding would be proven true within 10 years, however we wanted to find true, right? If you were correct, you'd get $10,000 back. So 10 to, one, 10 to one odds. How many fewer papers do you think would be published? Despite the fact that you'd only have to be right one in 10 times to break even. I suspect we would see far fewer papers published because I think people actually do know when they don't trust their own results. And again, if you widen your own interval, you'd be much more likely to be proven true. So, I, you know, I, I think part of it is we, we do know and we don't want to find out what's going to happen. So the incentive thing then undermining, yeah. undermining. The incentives those. just aren't there. Good question. Oh, sorry, I got it wrong. Well, I'm wondering if such a, it, it's a good practice, I think, for academics, if they were to kind of think about the public health implications like even mm -hmm. around uncertainty, um, I feel like that, like, for example, instead of writing it off and saying, oh, there's recall bias or there's some sort of bias that affected our estimate, if you're quantifying it, then in the discussion, you have to think about, well, what's the, like, what, what are the implications of even that magnitude, you know, like, mm -hmm. so I think it will force you to kind of think about, you know, public health practice, I think, instead of just writing it off and saying, oh, it could go either way, but like quantifying it, I think will help us explain it better and, and think about the ramifications, I think, of the findings. I think it's a great point. I think you're absolutely right. I, I also think that we as epidemiologists don't actually have really good understandings of what our particularly ratio-based estimates mean, right? So, mm -hmm. so whenever you teach, whenever you teach um, effect modification, you say, you know, you can do these tests to determine whether or not two things are different, but we don't really like them they're underpowered and we're not big fans of statistical you know, hypothesis testing. So really you have to decide whether or not two things are different. And students always say, yeah, but, but how do I decide? They say, okay, well, the way to decide is, would you make a different decision based on those two numbers? And every time I say that to students, I think to myself, I couldn't tell you the answer to that question. I don't know what the difference between a, a risk ratio of two and a risk ratio of 2.5 really means. Um, Despite you know, I, it even get, you know every uh, every field that's going to be different, right? Every baseline prevalence that that two point five corresponds to is going to mean something different, right? I mean, I think part is because we deal with ratio measures, we should be dealing with difference measures. But I don't know that we actually are are good at understanding what the actual implications are. And if we did a better job of of thinking about what that would actually you know what these differences would actually mean in real people's lives you know, on population level effects for policies, yeah, we might we might be far more hesitant to say we know the answer with certainty. Um, let's let's be more clear about that, the uncertainty around that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I, so, okay, so I have two questions about the example you did of doing a quantitative bias analysis on the no shots trial. Mm -hmm. um, so when you actually put the beta distribution, you centered it at, 0.7, which before I got the impression was like the worst case scenario. So it, it seemed like the distribution didn't reflect your belief about the distribution of the bias parameter. And then, you know, with that beta distribution, you had significant weight on like 0.5 sensitivities. Even. Um, it's like one, I, so I guess, yeah, one, one question is like, when you get to the point of putting distributions, should they reflect your beliefs or should those be kind of a sensitivity analysis of reflecting worst case? scenario 
Great question. No, they should they should reflect your beliefs. Um, so in that in that table, you're, you're absolutely right. We went to a lower limit of, of 0.7 as to what we considered to be the you know the the worst case scenario. But you know, I'm not uh, I'm not totally convinced that's the lowest limit. I mean, I think it probably could go a little lower. Um, I didn't have the I, I you know with the tools that we've developed the distributions. Uh, I don't have a distribution that um, that I that I that I am comfortable with that could have um, uh, put bounds on the lower limit easily and still looked like a beta distribution. So probably what I would have done is uh, shifted to a trapezoidal distribution where you can get a hard, you know, a hard lower limit and then allow things to trail off. So I, you know, I was in this particular example, you know, I probably do it a little bit differently, but, but the answer to the question is it, it should be your uncertainty. And again, anybody, if anybody disagrees, you've got all the tools available, right? You don't need my, my data set to be able to do the analysis. You can do your own. And it's only if they disagree that we have a problem, right? If you would draw different inferences based on your uh, analysis versus what I published as mine, that we have a problem. Um, and even if we do, what that tells us is, okay, we're, we're never gonna be able to answer this question unless we sort out the source of bias. When we do the next study, let's focus explicitly on that problem. Whereas if we get the same answer, we can say, okay, we can, we can move past this. And again, if, if all of epidemiology is an exercise in rational use of limited resources, let's target it to where it matters. Bias analysis helps us figure out what matters and what doesn't matter. And to that, then there are different methods for bias analyses. And so could you give some um, guidance on um, when or maybe we shouldn't use the fixed uh, fixed bias parameters or should we always be moving now towards uh, using uh, distribution-based bias parameters because the, the uncertainty was greater for the distribution. Yeah. So uh, the answer to that is it all depends on where you are in the in the inference drawing process. So if this is like the first study that's ever been done on a subject, you you know you have you know a bunch of sources of bias, but you also got really wide confidence intervals. Adding on a bias analysis isn't going to do anything there, right? So if you want to explore the impact of those biases, just do a simple bias analysis and see do the do the point estimates move a lot. Or, you know, is this something that we probably don't have to pay attention to? So one of the things I, I, I never have time to talk about is um, bias analysis can be done on a two by two table. If it can be done on a two by two table, that means you can actually do bias analysis for your study before you do the study. Because if you submit a protocol to an IRB, you have to do a sample size calculation, which is effectively your best guess at what the data that two by two table is going to look like before you do your study, you can do the bias analysis ahead of time to sort out ahead of time which sources of bias are actually likely to matter and which ones aren't. And then, you know, maybe you say, okay, you know, misclassification isn't going to matter a lot here as long as it's not differential. Let me put my money into, uh, you know, a less precise uh, measure of this and a better estimate of that, right? So we can, so it, it really just depends on the stage where you're at. If we're doing a meta-analysis where we've got really narrow confidence intervals and we're pretty confident we know the answer then you want the probabilistic bias analysis that's going to widen the uncertainty. You know, not, we don't want to widen it unnecessarily, but to something that validly tells us how much uncertainty we should have. So it really, it just depends on the state of the state of the science. I was thinking of, or wondering if, so one like a journal, who's expected on this point about trying to get journals to want to do it. It could be a fun project to take like American Journal of Epidemiology and like, you know, a year's worth of data and run sensitivity analyses and um, all of them based on the two by two and like publish a piece that says, you know, how different the uncertainty ranges would be had they just a one idea. But then also thinking it could be fun in the meta analysis if you did a meta analysis where you take the estimates that are given to you to come up with your final estimate. And then you do a second version where you do uncertainty around all of, you know, you add sensitivity analyses mm -hmm. around all of them and then take a meta-analysis of your new less certain <laughs> and, and show how that's different. I don't know. It just, yeah. 
just do like some fun things you could do. I totally agree. If anyone's looking for a project, that's a good <laughs> one. It's a, it's a really good one. Um, this meta analysis is a is a um, it's one where the methods have not completely um, uh, solidified yet. So some people do the uh, to the extent that it's done, which is incredibly rare, but to the extent that it's done, some people do the bias adjust every individual study. Um, Maya, Maya Mather has developed methods for bias adjusting the summary measure, which I think are interesting. Um, you know, where you go, I think probably depends on, again, how precise that estimate is in the beginning. But ultimately, I do think you probably want to go back to the individual studies. Uh, if you're really going to do it right. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's a great idea. <laughs> Yeah, there any scenarios where it's not practical to do bias or quantitative bias analysis and say all of the studies you might be doing in this room? Uh, where it's not practical, um, I'm not sure the answer. So, so I have focused on you know one source of bias, and I focused on a particular scenario with a dichotomous uh, outcome. We start getting into multi-level, you know, variables. There are methods for that. When you get to continuous measures, there are methods for that. So I'm not sure that any of those are, you know, the design or any of those things are limiting factors. I, I, I think the bigger issue is just whether it's it's warranted based on the state of the science and not so much based on, you know, the the practicalities. I, I can't off the top of my head. I can't think of a situation where it would be impractical to do so. I was thinking about something where you don't know. Biases. So even then, right, um, bias analysis is is helpful, I think, to just exploring, right, what is your, what are your vulnerabilities in your data, right? We say we, we don't know what the, you know, what the misclassification values are, but how much does it matter, right? How extreme would the misclassification have to be for it to, to, to change our, our thinking? We don't know, we don't, we don't know what the right answer is, so I'm not going to do a, a, a probabilistic bias analysis, but I'm just exploring what are the vulnerabilities in my data? And I think, you know, the more we understand our data, the better off we're going to be. So, yeah, I don't, I, yeah, I still think yeah, you could do it. Say like bias or just okay, now you're getting to my my weakness because yes, I, 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 it's really hard to do bias analysis for selection bias because not because it's it, it's it's incredibly simple to do. It's simpler than even the misclassification finding information on what the selection proportions are is impossible because unlike a misclassification where I, I know that I have misclassified you, I just don't know what you're, you know, oh, sorry, I know that I've misclassified some people, but I don't know what their correct value is. With selection bias, I don't know anything about you because you weren't in my study. So how do I guess how many people there are? It's really tough to do. So you may be right there. That, that may be a situation where it's just impractical. So your example about HPV, we didn't know that we were misclassifying people because we didn't have a gold standard. Yeah, so I think that at the tests were crappy though. We, did we right. know? Did we know? I don't know the answer to that. Did we know? Yeah. And oh. also I like that example and that the errors are also um, dependent on each other because yep. usually it was the same specimen that you're using for the HPV and the cervical cancer. Oh. So the non-differential misclassification example. There's one where the errors are clearly dependent. That has to do with how good a specimen you have. Okay. Well, so I just want I did not know that, but that's now going to be a, a good nice teaching one. example. That's great. So it just points out, like, in hindsight, now we can look back and say, oh, we were very wrong. Yeah. So looking, you know, trying to sort of project ahead and say in 10 years, if we look back or in 20 years, we look back and we'll see, oh, we were misclassifying people. Wouldn't it have been better if now we had a little curiosity around how we might be wrong, you know, poke holes in all of the assumptions that we're making and try to say like, how much different could our estimates yeah. be if it ends up that we're in an HPV cervical cancer situation? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the difficulty becomes uh, when there is, when, when small amounts of bias lead to large changes, because then you just, you never know. You do know that it, you're vulnerable in that case, but you don't know, you know, you don't have a good way to judge what's happening. But in a lot of cases where you find out, actually, it probably doesn't matter. At least you can then set that aside and focus on the things that do. Well, as you say, yeah, it points to the next, what is the next study? What should that focus yeah. on? 
quantifying the amount of misclassification, trying to build a better test, do whatever you, makes sense. Thanks, Matt. This was great. Really appreciate you coming to talk with us today, spending time with us. And um, I know that that um, this is going to be a topic of discussion that continues here after you go. So thank you. Can, can I just say thank you to you all? It's been such a pleasure chatting with you all today. I've really had a great day. And thank you. I'm sorry if I went over time. Right. Oh, no, no, it's good. It was perfect.